This lecture, Bezrat Hashem, Lerfuat, Adelia Chagilo, Bat Rachel, Avram, Ben Tova, and Eloi Nishmat, Elimelech, Ben Mordechai, Chaya, Bat Avram, Shmuel Tzvi, Ben Binyamin, Noach, Rafael, Ben Yosef, Chaim, and Lerfuat uh, Shlema, of David, Ben Chava, and Eloi uh, Nishmat, Natan, Ben Rachel, Zivug Tov, Lechaviv, Ben Mazal, and uh, הצלחה לרפאל רפיק בן יצחק, הצלחה בעסק, שמירה מהאתורטיז, לעינוי נשמת, my grandfather, סבא שמעון בן מרים, and also לעינוי נשמת ראובן בן יוסף. One announcement, this week I have a lecture in Chevy Chase in a shoulder at uh, 8.30. So it's going to be for Hanukkah, uh, this coming Thursday, right here in Queens. It's in 80-14 Chevy Chase Street, Jamaica. Sunday, I speak in Great Neck in uh, Kol Israel Achim Shul Rabbi Yalon, 429 Middle Neck Road. And one more announcement, you know, there is a, a program with Rabbi Yaakov Rahimi that connect people to Hevrutot. Just like we do in Israel, we have, Baruch Hashem, thousands of people learning daily with Hevruta. So you needed to do it here in English. So he asked me to announce, but before I forget, so it's called backtosinai.com. Please email them with your details and your contact information, and they will assign you someone to learn with. Those people don't have, uh, they don't come to shul to learn, they don't come to yeshiva to learn. Eventually what happens is it's like not feeding the soul. You know, you feed the body, but you don't feed the soul. And the difference between the body and the soul is that when you don't feed the body, after six hours the body would let you know. Headache, stomach is grinding, weakness. By 10, 15 hours, you're already done. Your body is laying down, refuse to cooperate. But there are people, Jews, that don't feed their soul 30, 40, 50 years, and the soul is quiet. Avovadi Yosef Zatzal gave a beautiful analogy about this, a beautiful parable. He said that the, the soul is a male rooster. And the body is a female rooster, if you, if a chicken. If you don't feed the, 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 the female, she would let you know by making a lot of noise and break your entire house. So you make sure there's always wheat and barley on the floor, otherwise your house will be destroyed. But if you don't feed the male, he walks quietly, walk, 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 until, boom, he falls and he dies. <laughs> he doesn't make a lot of noise. He died quietly. So Rav Uvadiyah Yosef, the legendary Chacham said, when you don't feed the body, the body makes a lot of problems, force you to eat. But if you don't feed your soul, you don't even feel it. You live in your darkness, spiritual darkness. The divine light of God is not reflecting on your soul. And you, and you live like this for, the, for, the, for your entire life. Sometimes we see in older people that they put filin for the first time in their life. You see, even complete secular people, they, one time they put filin, they see how excited they are. Like the neshama finally got food after so many years. Or if they listen to one 10 minutes video, it gets their attention to think all day. Why? Because the neshama is starving. So as long as we can as long as we can breathe, we can still fix things. Once we moved out of this world, the soul comes out one day. We don't know when it's going to be. That's a big mystery. Hashem doesn't want us to know. Some people are prepared for it. They get sick for X amount of months. Some people in a second, boom, they can fall and die. Or they get attacked by barbarian murderers like you saw in Israel two months ago, <laughs> can be 18, 19. We don't know what's, what's next for you in life. And we're not safe here, we're not safe in any city in the world. Jewish people 
are not safe right now, but they've never been safe. It's not that uh, there is, we are going out of the ordinary. But now the antisemite Nazis everywhere, they are fuming. Why? Because they are losing. When they see that the Jews fight for their life and they pay back to all these monsters and attack them and destroy them, it breaks their heart. You understand? I mean, some Gentiles are very good people. They know who's right and who's wrong. They know who's a tzaddik, who's a rasha. So, yeah, Baruch Hashem, they support the Jews. But unfortunately, uh, you have half of the world that is not. And you can see the hypocrisy everywhere we go. I know it sometimes breaks a lot of Jewish people's heart, but I'm telling you that it's the best thing that can happen to us. Do not eat your heart when the goyim hates us. Why? It's a part of God's plan. It's written in the Torah a few times. If God says to you that it's the best thing that can happen to you, that the goyim despites you, and they don't accept you, they don't want to marry you, they don't want to mix with you, and they don't want to help you, and they don't want you to even go through their land, who do you think makes them such stiff-necked people, so stubborn, they always want the bad for us? Well, why is it? The answer is, if all the nations will be nice to us, and every gen Gentile will welcome you and hug you and kiss you and tell you how great you are, you wonderful Jew, you're the son of God, you're the chosen people, we admire you, we love you, we want to marry you, we want to do business with you, we want to invest by you. After three, four generations from the time Judaism start, there would not be one Jew left in the world. Everyone will marry the nice Gentiles, will mix with them. Why? They're better than us. Look what wonderful people. They all accept us. They love us. Why? Let's not be racist. Let's not be prejudiced. They're very nice to us. They're welcoming. They're helping. They're supporting Israel. We should marry them. We should become one nation. And after four generations, the most, there will not be one Jew left in the world. And all this Torah and preparation for eternal life, all of that will go down the drain. Now, I want to remind you, in the Torah it's written that God made a covenant with Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. He gave them the Torah in a public event. And he chose their children for eternity to be his children. You are my children. I chose you from all the nations to be mine. I do not give you any permission to imitate the Gentiles, to call yourself with their names, to dress like them, to get involved with them, definitely not to marry any of them, even if they are the nicest one, there's no permission. Even if the Gentile is a million times better than you, you are a very, very low-level Jew, you are a very wicked Jew, and this Gentile is a very righteous Gentile. I make a rule by giving you today the Torah, you are my VIP club. You have no permission to get mixed with any other clubs out there. This is your place. They want to join the VIP club, no problem. They can convert. If they're serious, if they love me as a God, they love my Torah, they want to keep Shabbat, they want to put filin, they want to dress modest, they want to eat kosher, they're more than welcome. We'll check, we'll see how serious they are. We are not missionaries. The Jewish people never, ever begged any Gentile to join the Jewish nation. Never. The opposite. Here, Rav Golan is in a bad deal, he will tell you. When they want to convert, call next year. What's, what do you need to be Jewish? Stay righteous Gentile. What do you need a headache? Other uh, religions, all the fake religions out there, all they do is hunt souls. You must be Christian. You have to believe in JC. If not, you're going to hell. You have no shelter to the world to come if you won't convert to Christianity. That's all what they sell you. Why? <laughs> they have nothing else to sell besides threatening you. You're going to lose your next world. Why? You have to believe in JC. It's a missionary religion, completely fake. Islam, the same thing. You must become Muslim, if not, we'll kill you. If you don't uh, join Islam, you have no shelter to the world to come. Judaism doesn't say that. It says you have to stay Gentile, stay righteous Gentile. You're going to heaven of Gentiles. You don't have to be Jewish. No, but I want to. Believe me, it's hard for you. Stay what you are. Do yourself a favor. Stay a righteous Gentile. After we see that he's a real nudnik, he doesn't give up. He keeps coming again and again. He's begging. He's crying. 
You can ask Rav Golan how many of them crying inside the water. Huh? Nine out of ten at least. Every time we do conversion, where there is a man, where there is a woman, usually the ladies are more, uh, you know, emotional. You have to see how these goyot and goyim, how they cry inside the mikveh and shaking, they can't even say the brachot. We have to repeat a few times the brachot, they get confused because it's the happiest moment of their life. They cry, with the shivering, why? Finally their mission achieved. They had a dream to become a kosher Jew. It breaks my heart to see so many of my brothers and sisters who have zero knowledge in Judaism. They live mamash like another species in nature. No consideration to God. No, nobody cares about the purpose. Nobody understands what's the consequences of his actions. People live the moment, enjoy, just enjoy the moment. But what's going to be with later on? <laughs> Everything will be displayed when we leave the world. We're going to have a one-year trial. Everyone in the court of heaven will see every little thing you did, good or bad. Do you know the shame you're going to have? Some people are Syrians, uh, Moroccans, Persians. They come from holy families. Holy families. You know, if you go all the way to the most, to the highest, highest Rabbanim, Yemenite, Moroccans, uh, Tunisians, from very holy families. Some of them even grandchildren of the Rambam of the Shulchan Aruch, oh, and by Ashkenazim also, Gaon Nivilna, all Gdole Olam, the Rama. And now he's a secular, like a goy, full of tattoos, no Shabbat, no kosher food, much <laughs> no connection to Hashem. And then they show him in the court of heaven, your grand-grandson was Rashi, your grand-grandfather was Rashi. Look at you, look at Rashi, look at you. Your grand-grandson of Rabbi Yaakov Abu Hatzera, or Rabbi Pinto, or... The Ariya Kadosh or Rabbi Chaim Vital. Wow. Imagine the, the shock of their life they're going to get. Because over there, there's no more Yetzirah, no more evil inclination. It's all true. A world of true. That's it. No fakeness. Here in the court, everyone lied. Over there, you can lie. You're sitting in front of Hashem in your trial. You're standing over there, and everything is being reviewed. Even your thoughts are analyzed. Nobody can run away. It's written clearly, it's verse. Ayn ro'a ve'ozen shoma'ad ve'chol ma'asecha ba'sefer nikhtavim. There's an eye who constantly watch you, there's an ear who constantly listens to you, and everything you do is being recorded. Everything. Meaning, you will see every second of your life on the, on the stage, on the screen. Now, the question is, if you're going to see pleasant things, which will bring you a lot of honor, or you see horrible things which will bring you a huge shame, and unfortunately punishment later on, it's 100% in your hand. And before I move to my topic tonight, I just want to read one halakha by the Rambam. My money, this 900 years ago, this was written. It took him 30 years to write it. 30 years. That's, by the way, from all the books of the Rambam, the only one he wrote in Lashon HaKodesh. All other books were written in Arabic. This was written in Lashon HaKodesh. Why? Do you know why? Because the other books are more like philosophy, explanation for the Mishnayot, this. But here, it's Halakha Lemaaseh. It's the law. Everyday law. If you write it in Arabic, there could be ten different interpretations. What did he really mean? You can translate this word like this, like that. When it comes to divine laws, you must write it in Lashon HaKodesh. Why? Because there should not be any argument. So the Rambam writes here, in chapter 5, in the laws of repentance, first halacha, Reshut kol adam netunalo. Every person has permission from Hashem. אם רצה לעטות עצמו לדרך טובה, if he wants to push himself to a positive path, ולהיות צדיק, and to be righteous, הרשות בידו. It's 100% in his hand. Nobody tells him be or don't be, 100% your choices. ואם רצה לעטות עצמו לדרך רעה, if he wants to push himself to a wicked path, and to be wicked, הרשות בידו. Also 100% permission to do whatever you like. <laughs> However, who is written in the It's written in the Torah. And Adam, he was one of them, to know good and bad. 
person is like the angels. They can see what's good and what's bad. Kloma is not like animal. An animal doesn't understand what's right and what's wrong. The animal, when, they, when a lion murders a zebra, he doesn't feel guilty. Why? He needs to eat. <laughs> this is the way it's programmed. Animals don't have shame. They can have intimacy in front of a million people. They're not ashamed. They don't have spirituality. They don't have a divine soul. But we and the angels are spiritual. We actually are in a higher level than the angels. The higher, the higher level than the angels, because the angels are also programmed to do their job in the creation. As I explained in my series, The Way of God, Derech Hashem by Lutzato, the Ramchal. But that's not the topic right now. So I just, just want to finish this halacha. And it says like this, Klomar, en min zeh shel ha'adam, haya echad ba'olam, ve'en lo min sheni domelo. The human race, the human being, is one kind that there is no other kind that's similar to him. Beze ha'inyan she'ehu me'atzmo, mida'ato, machshavato, yodea to ve'ara. Person knows from his opinion, from his knowledge, from his thoughts, what's good and what's bad. But still he chose to do whatever he likes. Meaning he can do horrible things. But he can do wonderful things. He chose what to do. There is no power or energy or interference with his choices. Nobody tells, you, do this, tells him do this or do that or do not do it. It's 100% full control. He is controlling the will. And therefore, right, you know, the, therefore the conclusion of this, we should know, we should understand the difference between us and the animals is one difference only. The animals are stronger, faster, better in many things than what we do. They have abilities we don't have. An eagle can watch the entire New York City in an hour. It will take us 10 years to do it flying with a drone. An eagle can do it. Lion runs faster, cheetah, all this. They have much bigger, better skills, stronger, more powerful. Do you know how brilliant is a bird building a nest? Did you ever see a bird, how it built a nest? You need to go to college 10 years to build such thing, with such unbelievable engineering. Do you know what GPS the bird has? You have billion trees in upstate New York, billions. And the bird make a nest under all the top of the trees. And the bird goes 10 miles away to find for worms to bring to the nest. And it can, and flies all the way and knows exactly from one billion trees to know the, the one tree where the tree, it built the, the nest and land right into the nest to feed the babies over there. That's way before we invented ways, GPS, that take you to Baka and Galbi, Al Garbia, that the Arabs will slaughter you over there. Make a left. I'm going to Tel Aviv. What do you mean, make a left? You get to Baka and, and Garbia, make a left. Why? You make a left, you'll be dead. Why? P your GPS, made by people. People make mistakes. But the animals are programmed like robots. Psh, everything precise. But there's one thing we are better than them. We are the only species that can choose to do something against our will. No animal can do such thing. For instance, if you tell the cheetah, don't attack the, the, the sheep now. We want to take some pictures. Wait five minutes and then eat them up. There's <laughs> nobody to talk to. He's hungry now, he must attack. You cannot stop him. There's no way to convince the cheetah to wait 10 minutes before it murdered the, the, the goat. People can choose to do against their will. He wants to marry this Goya, but he realized the Torah doesn't give permission. He gave up his plan. What he wanted, to do it. Hashem said, you're not allowed. Okay, I surrender. He doesn't, he's not in the mood now to go pray. But he forced himself to do it. Why? It's the right thing for himself to do. He's not doing anyone a favor. Speaking to God, you have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Putting tefillin on the heart, dedicate the heart, dedicate the head to the creator of the world. You have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the creator of the world and you turn it down? That's up to you. Nobody tells you yes or no. 
If you're not in a mood and you still woke up in the morning and went to the synagogue and joined your friends and did it and sang a little bit and heard beautiful divrei Torah, you get into it. Once you start, you love it. But the idea is you want to eat something not kosher. They told you, I'm sorry, it's not kosher, this meat. Okay, wow, well, but you're hungry, no? Eat, no? I can't touch it. Why? God say you're not allowed to eat it. So therefore, you see that a person can overcome his desires. He can do what's right, not what he feels like. And because of that, he is the only species in nature that is subject to reward and punishment. If he does right, he will get his reward. And if he does against the instructions, he was supposed to fight his desire, he didn't, he's going to jail. He can get execution. In some country, they'll execute him. Why? Why did you do it? Well, I, I was angry. Control your anger. Nobody execute a lion because he ate some zebra in a safari. Why? That's the way of the world. If a person murders someone, you know what, the, what will be the law, right? So we understand that. And one just last thing and we move on. Don't dare to think what the foolish people of the nations and Rov Golneb Bnei Israel and the dumb Jews, dumb Gentiles and dumb Jews, doesn't <laughs> bottom line, everyone, every human being. Shakadosh Baruch Hu Gozer Al Adam Mitchilat Briatol Yot Sadiq Or Asha. Do not dare to even think, needless to say, to say, just to think even that God decreed on a person when he was created, if you will be righteous or wicked. Don't dare to think even such a thing. This is completely wrong. Every human being can be righteous like Moshe Rabbeinu, like Moses, or can be wicked like Yerovam ben Avat. Can be smart, can be a fool. Depend, if we will learn, he will be smart. He doesn't want to learn, he'll stay a fool for the rest of his life. He can be merciful, he can be cruel, and all other things. It's 100% in his hand. No one is forcing him to which path to enter. So if he did the right thing, he gained. And if he did the wrong thing, he lost. More or less in 10 minutes, I concluded this. And that brings me to my topic tonight. We, have, uh, we read on Shabbat, Parashat Vaishlach. There's a lot of things that we have to clarify here. You know, when you learn the, the parasha, you don't learn the parasha like you read an article in a newspaper. You have to understand every word, every sentence, what's, what's really behind it. Now, I want you to know the Torah is not a history book. The Torah is a book of instructions for life. It's directions. Torah, every verse in the Torah, it's direction. Direction, what to do, what not to do. To learn what's right and what's wrong. You want to be a good lawyer? You attach yourself to a good lawyer. You want to be a great sur sur surgeon, brain surgeon? Attach yourself to the best brain sur surgeon. You want to be a car mechanic? Attach yourself to a 30 years old great mechanic that find the problem in two minutes. As experience and knowledge, you want to be a righteous person, attach yourself to righteous, knowledgeable speakers and rabbis and learn what's right and what's wrong. And one of the ways to do it is to start listening to the lectures. And where the rabbis will bring you the information from the university, no, for that you can go to Bernie Sanders. He'll teach you what's in the university. You want to learn the way of life? You come to the people that will teach it to you directly from the book of God. And today we're going to learn a few interesting things. Some of them are surprising. We have two brothers, Yaakov and Esav. Everybody knows Yaakov is the tzaddik. Esav is the rasha. From very young age, he's already wicked. He's in a field, he's a hunter, he does all kinds of things that a person should not do. And his brother Yaakov, Ishtam Yoshev Walim, a complete person, righteous, sitting in a tent. What is he doing in a tent? Looking at a canvas? He's learning Torah all day. All his life he learns Torah, he's a lover of Torah. In his time, you have Yeshiva of Shem Vaever. Shem is the son of Noah. 
Noah had three sons. After the flood, the Hashem killed all the wicked people in the world. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah, they got burned. The people of the flood got flushed out. And that time we have a big tzaddik, the son of Noah. His name is Shem. In English, Sem. Somebody hates Jews, they call him anti-Semite, anti-Shemi. Why? Because we came from the, from the son Shem. Someone who hates us, anti-Semite. He hates the children of Shem, which is us. Later, ten generations later, we have Avraham Avinu. Avraham, he already knows all the mitzvot, keeps all the mitzvot. It's written in the Torah. I love Abraham, that he keeps my Torahs and my commandments. And not only that, he'll teach it to his children. So you see, that Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, they kept the whole Torah. So Yaakov is learning Torah, and his brother is a hunter. He's in a field. He's not interested in spirituality. Hayadayim yedeh Esav, the hands are the hands of Esav. Ve'akol kol Yaakov. And the speech is the power of the Jewish people. Jewish people don't need to prove themselves in a field, not in a war, not in a combat, not in flying, not in engineering. It's all beautiful. I mean, yes, you need Parnassah, so you learn, you make a living. But that's not our main purpose in life. Doesn't matter, you're a doctor, you're an engineer, you're a math teacher, I don't know, you, whatever you are, one thing you should know, that the main thing in your life is spirituality, connection to Hashem, faith, following the right path, and learning Torah daily. Just like you feed your body, you never forget, you must feed your soul daily. Now let's see some of the things the parasha has to tell us. Esav is on the way to Yaakov with 400 mercenaries, 400 Hamas terrorists, or maybe jihad, they're on the way to kill one Nebech. Yaakov is a mama. Yaakov is a, is a, is a fighter. He's going to fight Yesav. Yesav is a killer. He's a hunter. He knows how to hunt. Yaakov is a bachur yeshiva. You want to kill your brother, he's a bachur yeshiva. He's a scholar in yeshiva. Why do you need 400 murderers to come with you? Born an arrow, sword, horses. <laughs> what is the, what's going on here? Question number one. Question number two. Yaakov, it's written, Vayira Yaakov me'od, Vayetzer lo. Yaakov was very afraid. Very afraid. Ma ze Vayetzer lo? Vayetzer lo meaning he was upset, disappointed. So what is going on in this verse? In the first words, is he got very scared. Why? He found out that the Sav is on the way. But the question is, it's written that Yaakov sent angels, Yaakov sent angels to check that is, what's the story with the Sav? Is he angry? Did he come down? What's the story with him? So first of all, why, what kind of angels you are? In the Torah, angels can be real angels. When you say malachim, it can be sometimes spiritual angels, or it can be messengers. Why Hashem called the angels malach? Because he does melacha. Melacha means he, he has a mission. You send him on a mission. Each malach goes on one mission only. You don't mix between the two missions. And the name, and the name of the angel is named after his mission. Like for instance, Angel Raphael. Raphael is a very common Jewish name. Raphael means God will cure. Raphael is in charge of medicine, in charge of curing people. So every angel has a special name. The name is based on a mission that he was chosen to do. It's very interesting. So now Yaakov sends angels to check what's with the Sav. Rashi writes, real angels. Common sense would say that Yaakov sent, he would send regular people. He has few people who works for him. Ride your horses, go check what's with my brother Esav. He's on the way here. 
But Rashi writes something very interesting. No, it wasn't people. It was real angels. The question is, how do we know? It can be a commentary on the Torah, but you cannot make up things. You have to have a source. How Rashi knows that these are real angels, that he didn't really send people? The answer is, if someone come to kill you, and you are afraid that he's coming to kill you, you're afraid. You know he's a dangerous man. He's been waiting for you for many, many years to kill you. And now he's finally on the way to achieve his mission. Are you allowed to send people to meet somebody like that, that is so dangerous? You know the Hamas terrorists are on the way, they're looking for you. So you have a few friends, you want to send them to meet the Hamas terrorists on the way. To find out if they're angry at you, if they're really coming to kill you or not. You're allowed or no? You're allowed to put Jews in a place of, uh, of danger or no? You're not allowed. Yaakov is a holy man. Hashem, Hashem, God testified that he's a tzaddik. If Yaakov would send people and risk their life, he could never be a tzaddik after that. The fact that it's not allowed to do such thing shows us that he sent real angels. And it's not the first time Yaakov is talking to an angel. Just later on in the parasha, you see the angel of Esau is fighting with him all night. And in the end, he told him, I don't let you go until you bless me. So the angel of Esav is talking to Yaakov. It's not the first time he's speaking to angels. When Yaakov was in the Moriah mountain, he had a dream that ladder, angels going up and down. And Hashem is talking to him and is promising him he's going to keep him and guard him and give him everything he needs. He see the angels going up and down. So Yaakov is a very holy man. No wonder we are named after him. His name was changed to Israel. So the question now, Abotai, so he sends real angels. The angels come back and they get him even more scared. What do they say? Esav is coming, he's furious, he has 400 men, he's coming to kill you. Now the question is, I don't get it. If God would come to me, to me, ordinary person, and say to me, from this moment on, I want you to know I'm guarding you, I'm watching over you, I will defend you no matter what. I will give you what to eat. I will give you and your children what to wear. You don't have to be worried about anything. I'm with you in every step of your way. And someone just told me, be careful. A group of terrorists are on the way to kill you. A group of terrorists are on the way to kill you. And I know Hashem, not, uh, well, you know, if you went to some Baba, fake Baba, <laughs> And you came to him and he said, put, put 5,000 in a jar. Let me see what I see. In the name of the Baba Sali and the Baba this and Baba that and Baba D. I see things, oh, you have big eye around you. Put another 5,000 in a jar. <laughs> okay, no, if he promised you that you are guarded, you know that his promise worked like a peel of a garlic. But if Hashem himself speaks to you, there's no mistakes. So Hashem already promised Yaakov that he's safe. Why is he afraid? I'll give you another question. Moshe Rabbeinu, right? Moshe, the greatest person ever lived, Moshe Rabbeinu. He comes, Hashem sent him to Paro, the king of Egypt, the wicked king, Paro. Hashem said to Moshe, throw the cane on the floor. And the cane turned into a snake. What did Moshe do? Ran away. Vayanos <laughs> mipanav. He saw some cobra. Very scary. He ran. I don't get it. In your head, in your head, you already know that you're in a divine mission. God sent you. He spoke to you in a burning bush and sent you to Egypt to take the Jewish nation out from slavery to freedom. There is no way in the world you're going to die now in the middle of the plan. What is, God is going to make a fool out of himself? It's, it's not possible. You're in the middle of the job now. You're coming, you're standing in front of the wicked king. You're about to hit him with 10 plagues. What in the, now, what are you afraid of the snake? Give the snake a smack, be quiet. <laughs> Why Moshe ran away? I'll tell you a story, you get the point. 
In Manhattan, they made an experiment. Experiment. They put a bathroom in one of the avenues, Third, Lexington, one of them, when a lot of people walk in the street. They made the bathroom like a room on the sidewalk. Outside is mirrors, inside clear glass. So when you go into the bathroom, if you decide to sit down, you see all the people coming towards you. They don't see you, they see a mirror. I don't have to tell you what happened when women see mirrors. <laughs> Every one of them come. <laughs> so now, the, all the men who wanted to use the bathroom, as soon as he sat down, he looks, he sees somebody comes. <laughs> but he saw from the outside that it's mirrors. So meaning, in his brain, he knows nobody can see him. But when he sees two eyes are staring at him, even though the brain knows, the heart cannot digest the knowledge. It's called, in, in psychology, it's called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance, meaning what the intelligence, what the brain catch quickly, may take years for the heart to adjust. I'll give you an example. When Albert Einstein published his discoveries, he sent it to all the top scientists in the world. Nobody believed until then what Einstein found. And all of them review it. They didn't find, of course, any mistakes. And they threw it to the garbage. Impossible. It cannot be. Impossible. How many years it took the scientists to admit that Albert, Albert Einstein is right, and all the scientists until now were all wrong. How many years? Seven years of back and forth debating. Seven years. When they review his discoveries, it was 100% clear. I mean, it cannot be argued. It's math. Math. You can argue with math. Show the mistake. You, you want to disprove it, show where the mistake is. I cannot find mistake. My results are the same. So why can't you admit? It cannot be. The brain understands in an hour or five minutes, depending on how complicated it is. Seven years it took for the heart to finally understand that it's the right thing. And today everyone agrees with that. Everything you say, by the way, the Ramban, the Ramban already said 750 years ago. So basically 700 years before Albert Einstein. How come no one in colleges teach about the Ramban? He was a rabbi. <laughs> They're not interested in rabbis. They want a secular Jew, a communist, a socialist. Nice mustache, hair all over. <laughs> it sells. Man, I'm sure rabbi with a turban. The Ramban from Spain, come on. The Ramban, on the word Bereshit, in the beginning, first word in the Torah, Bereshit bara elokim et ha-shamayim et ha-aretz. What does it mean Bereshit? In the beginning. So the Ramban say, what does it mean in the beginning? Once material was created, time started to work. Meaning, where do you have material? You have time. If there's no material, there's no time. Once Hashem created the world, in less than a second, everything was created, then he organized everything in six days. But the raw material and everything the world has, boom, it was all done. Once Hashem created from nothing something, which nobody can do, only the creator of the world. Once the world was created, the time started one, two, three, four, until today. If there is no material, there's no way to measure time. Because in physics, you have formulas. The, 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 time, the, the distance multiplied by speed, they have formulas that they can calculate time. For instance, the Earth is rotating in 1,700 kilometers per hour. It's about 17 times faster than your car on a highway. When you drive your car, 60, 65, that's 100 kilometers per hour. 
the earth is rotating around itself 17 times faster, like zooming. Even a Ferrari, it will be nine times faster. Very fast. How come we don't feel it? Because it's a huge thing. If it was a small thing, <laughs> we'd we'll all be dizzy. It's designed in such a way. This 1,700 kilometer per hour is from the minute the world was created until today. Not a second faster, not a second slower. If the Earth would change the speed, every one of your Patek Philippe watches will go to the garbage and will not worth a penny, because it can never tell the right time. The only way to know time is if the Earth will rotate in the right speed from the beginning of the world to the end of days. It can never change the speed. That's why you have 24 hours, and that's why you know what, until what time you can say Shema Israel in the morning, and until what time you can pray Shachrit, and what time you can start praying Mincha, and what time is the appearance of the stars. All of that, you cannot be a Jew, a follower of Torah, without correct system that show time. It's, it's a main part in Judaism. You want to know if you're allowed to circumcise the baby or not. You need to know. For instance, he was born Friday, mamash, on a second between Friday and Shabbat. Friday on Shabbat. You want to know when to circumcise him, Friday or Shabbat. If the earth will sometimes go fast, sometimes slow, there would be no way to ever know when the baby was born. Maybe it was Shabbat. It depends on the earth. We don't know. Maybe a day sometimes will be 25 hours instead of 24. Sometimes it will be 22. It will mess up the world. There's no purpose for the world. The whole Torah will become a piece of paper. So in order for us to follow Judaism, the time must be accurate. And that's why the speed of the earth and all the galaxies and the sun and the moon and the rotation of the, of the moon around the earth must be precise because it has to come every 29.530590. Every month, the renewal of the moon must be always at least 29, 29 days, 29, uh, you know, 29 days, two thirds of the hours, which is 40 minutes, and uh, 73 halakim, which is three minutes and some and few seconds. It gives us 29.530590. 29 Today, NASA found that the cycle of the moon is 29.530590. Five, eight, eight, two ten thousand of the second difference between what Hashem said and what NASA said with thirty billion dollars investment. We had it for free in the Talmud. <laughs> then the Germans in 1965 in Berlin, you know the Germans are more precise than Americans. You can see the difference on the cars, the quality. And in every other thing they do, they're very devoted. They're very, very precise. The Yeke mentality, the German mentality is to be on time. If you're late, you're done. Here in America, I'll be there at 9 o'clock, you show up 11.30. What happened? Traffic. It's always true. There's <laughs> always traffic. But in, uh, if you go to a German shul, you know, sometimes I go to a place to pray. With Ashkenazim, the Yekes, not regular Ashkenazim, Yekes. You know what Yeke means? It has to be on a minute. So when they want to say Arvit, my Riv, they say my Riv, 8.23. They'll never say 20 or 8.25. It's always on a second. One time I asked my friend, oh, I see they got a new clock. He said to me, you know what is this clock? I said, what? He said, it's an atomic clock. And it's precise to the second. Why? God forbid they'll make a mistake 10 seconds. Very, very pedantic. So the, the, one person made a joke. One guy came to the Gabai of the shul. He said, Arvit now? The Gabai said, No. Now. <laughs> hey, you want to take five seconds? 
So that's called German mentality. Tov. So the Germans in 1965, they wanted to check their own research. They came to 29.530, 589, very close to the Torah. One ten thousand of a second difference. And later, one person told me in one of the lectures a few years ago that they updated to the exact number of the Talmud. So that's the cycle of the moon. That's how we know when Rosh Chodesh is. It's called the Molad of the Levana. They announce it in the Shul. Every month they know exactly what, when is the second, precisely, that the moon begins its new cycle. On a second! And from then, you have 15 full days to do Birkat Alvana. Once you pass 15 days, that's it, because the Lavana, the moon, is re reduced after 15 days. From 0 to 15, it's growing. From 15 to the 30th, it's on the way down, which means it's disrespect to make bracha for Hashem when something is declining. You have to say the bracha when something is on a rise, not on a fall. The idea. So up to the 15, we say Berkat Alvana. Why don't we say until the 18, 19? Because the Levana is disappearing. It's on the way down. Why the Levana is big and small? The Levana is always the same size, the moon. It's just the angle, the reflection of the sun on the moon. What can we see? What part of it we can see? So the time exists only where material is. If you're wondering how can it be, I'll give you one proof. If you ever went to sleep at midnight, 12.00, 12 12.03, your wife woke you up. Moshe, why are you crying? Oh, wow, thank God it's a dream. I had a horrible dream. Then bring me water. She brings him water, he drinks the water. Tell me what happened. He began to describe a big nightmare. How long was the nightmare? Six months. Six months! I was in a boat, the boat crashed. I was in the middle of the ocean for three days with no food. Sun is on my head, sharks all around me. I was screaming to Hashem, please save me. I promise I'll put filin and keep Shabbat. <laughs> then after three days, a boat came. They picked me up. What? Hezbollah terrorist on the way to Lebanon, from Iran to Lebanon. What do we say in Hebrew? Me'apach el apachat. You know what it means, me'apach el apachat? <laughs> from a small garbage can to a bigger garbage can. They dumped you. So I arrived to Lebanon, they electrocute me, beat me up, cursing my mother, cursing this, cursing that. They went into my bank account, cleaned all the money, wired it to their account. So his wife said to him, I don't get it. You fell asleep three minutes ago. You only started your regular snoring a minute ago. That's when I know you really fell asleep. So how is it possible that in 60 seconds that you were asleep, and I just woke you up, how six months of events with discussions and conversation fit in 60 seconds? How? Conversation take hours. Electrocuting take hours. Being on a boat in the middle of the ocean may take days. How does it fit in 60 seconds? The answer, it's a spiritual experience. The soul, when you go to sleep, immediately part of it comes out of the body. That part can receive a download from Hashem in less than a second. The scientists say that the longest dream is nine seconds. That's really what it is. In nine seconds, you can have a year of events. Why? Because this is what God wants you to feel. By the way, this is the answer to those who ask, how can a person go to hell? A person was very evil. He died one day. How can he go to hell? Hitler, Saddam Hussein, all these horrible people, the Jewish traders who betrayed their nation. How can they go to hell? The body went to the grave. The worms will eat the body. But the soul goes up to Hashem, it's written. Ve'aguf yushav la'afar, and the body will return to the sand where he came from. It's, it's a verse. And the soul will return to God that gave it. So if the soul went back to God, how exactly went to hell? The answer, it's like a simulator. 
Same thing in a dream. You can have 500 years of suffering and then wake up and find out that it was a dream. But inside the dream, you felt 500 years in Auschwitz. Horrible experience. You don't really need the physical body to be burned. It can be burned in a dream. It's an experience that the soul is going through. Same pain. All the physical feelings you have, it's all in the soul. If the soul comes out of the body, a person just died. Five seconds ago, the soul came out. You beat him up. Wake up, wake up. He's dead. Take a cigarette. Start burning it on his body. He doesn't feel anything. Same body. Everything the same. What changed? The soul is out. The body doesn't feel anything. The body is a piece of, piece of, like piece of wood, piece of meat. You burn a piece of meat in a butcher shop, the meat is going to scream? No. As soon as the soul comes out, nothing works. Not the nerve system, nothing. But if the soul returns back into the body, he begins to scream. Ah! What happened? Because what feels the pain is the soul, not the body. Same thing, everything is in the soul. A person can be in Vietnam, he saw all his friends getting killed, he made it, he's now laying down on a beach in Florida, puts in the headphones one of the battles that he recorded when he was in Vietnam, he hear all his friends screaming, John, help me, I'm dying, please, that, this, that. And what happened? He gets a heart attack. And you know, on his death certificate, the doctor writes, the cause of death, getting 10 in Miami Beach. But every fool knows that that's not the, the reason. Why did he get a heart attack? Because his soul was now visiting in Vietnam 30 years ago, 40 years ago, back then. And the panic got him a heart attack. The body doesn't feel here, there, the body is where the body is. By the way, Chazal, the Gemara say, a person is not where his legs are, is where his mind is. You can be inside the shul and play with your phone two hours. Where were you? Not in a lecture. It doesn't count you came to a lecture in Shamayim. God doesn't give you reward for coming to the lecture. Actually, he gives you punishment for listening to Torah, ignoring it, and play with your stupid news or your bank account, or sport, whatever you do on your phone. So when you come to a Shi'ur Torah and you play with your phone two hours, first you're not getting any reward for the Shi'ur Torah, but you're also insulting Hashem. Someone is talking words of Torah, of this, that, words of wisdom, and you prefer to be somewhere else. Where does it count like you are, where your mind is? Even if you don't play with your phone. You're in a shiur and you think about your hard day you had at work. You think about all the problems you had today at work. Your mind is right there. You're not here. So, Rabotai, I gave an example of Moshe is afraid because he saw the snake. Why? Same reason why a person could, now one person could actually use the bathroom because he saw people are staring at him. Even though in his mind he knew that they cannot see him. Same thing, if you have a glass between you and your friend, and your friend will hit the glass close to your eyes, you go like this. Why? In your head, you know there's no way to touch you. It's a thick glass. So why you won't go like this and scream? Your coffee just spilled all over you. Why? Because it's called natural reflection. Fear always comes naturally. You can control the fear later on by reminding yourself there is a God and everything is happening 100% according to what he wants. So why Yaakov is afraid? Yaakov knows that Hashem promised him not, you know, not, nothing bad can happen to him. Esav is on the way. So first reaction when you hear Esav is on the way, your heart drop. But after five seconds, hey, wait a minute, why am I afraid of? I have no reason to be afraid. Hashem gave me a guarantee that not one hair can fall from my head. So why Yaakov is afraid? Who knows? The Gemara answered these questions. Pachad Yaakov, Shema, Igro Machet. Yaakov said, when Hashem promised me all these promises, I was in a high level, very righteous. Since then, until now, Time has passed. 
Maybe I'm no longer in the status that I had at that time. Maybe Hashem now is not so pleased with me. What makes me think that I have a guarantee not to get hurt? So immediately we learn from here one very important thing. One, righteous people are always worried about their spiritual level. Wicked people never worry. Ah, I'm great. I have nothing to worry about. I'm tzaddik. I don't uh, steal from anyone. You know how many times secular people told me, I never steal, I never hurt anyone, I don't do this, I don't do that. I say to them, you don't steal? Can you swear on your life you never stole? Of course, I promise you what, you suspect me I'm a thief? No, no, I didn't mean you rob a bank. But how many times you went to a pizza store and used their napkins and straw? How many times? Ah, you call it stealing? <laughs> yes, it's stealing. Imagine someone on a pizza store and every second someone from the street comes to use napkins. Or to use the bathroom and he doesn't buy anything. By the end of the month, one month, the owner of the pizza store is bankrupt. The Gemara speaks about it. There was a wood, a wood fence. Every person that passed by take a tiny piece of toothpick to clean his teeth. Cheap, a little piece. So the owner of the fence screamed to him, shame on you, you thief. Say, you care about this? You really that uh, pedantic? It's so strict. What's the big deal? I have to get, ask you permission to take a little piece from your, from your wooden uh, fence? He said, everyone that passes here, take a little piece. What will be next month? The whole fence, $30,000 to go around the property, will go down the drain. Every person took one penny. One penny, that's it. What happened after a month or two? Nothing is left. Every person try your car, one mile. He got to the dealer. You want to buy a brand new car? Yeah, well, what car has 7,000 miles? It's only one month old. Yeah, people use it for road test. Ah, <laughs> the value just went down, $20,000. It's a used car already. Ah, 100, 300 miles, fine, nobody cares. But little by little, the things add up. So what do we learn from here? We should never take for granted that everything will be fine. No. People say, oh, Hashem is with us. We will win. We will win. We will win the Hamas. How do we know? How do we know? Maybe they have things waiting for us that we're not dreaming. What do you think? They're dumb? Iran is behind them. The Iranians are very sharp and clever and sneaky and have tons of money, courtesy of Hussein Obama. Released for them a hundred billion dollars and since then they turned it into a trillion. This idiot. So, the question is, how do you know we will win? There's no guarantee at all that we will win. Who told you Hashem is pleased with us? Hashem pleased with gay parades? They don't have gay parades, these monsters. Hashem pleased with naked married women walking on the street? No, it's against the Torah. They don't dare to let their women go naked. Hashem is pleased with heresy that people refuse to say God willing? Or every one of these monster Nazis scream Allahu Akbar 5,000 times a day. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Worse than Nazis and scream Allahu Akbar. And Jewish professor refused to say God willing. Did you know that the Israeli army has a law? When I was a soldier, someone told me that I refused to believe it. And back then you didn't have Google to check. The Israeli army, I don't know, I hope today they changed it. But in my days, they had a law inside the army that you're not allowed to write on a military document Be'ezrat Hashem. You're not allowed to write. It's against the army rules. <laughs> Technically, they could have sued you for that. And, and penalize you if you wrote Basad or Be'ezrat Hashem. The Israeli army. So when these Nazi monsters scream God, God, God all day and the children of God refuse to scream God, refuse to scream Shema Israel, there's no guarantee we will win. No guarantee. The Torah have examples when we won, when we were attached to Hashem, we, we always won. When we were wicked, we lost. We had wars, 24,000 people died, 14,700 died, 3,000 people died. 
in one wall in the time of the Torah. And pandemics, people die. We had war between us, Shevet Binyamin and the rest of Israel, Pilegesh Bagiva, 50,000 Jews kill each other. Did you ever know that? 50,000 Jews killed each other over one incident. No, there was no unity. So sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. The last time we won a war, by the way, who knows when was it? The Six Days War, 40 years ago. That's it. Since then, we never won a war. 1967. Do you know why we never won a war since then? Every one of the battles with the Arab we lost, or partially lost, like Yom Kippur, we had over 3,000 dead until we started to save Israel. We were about, about to dump nuclear bomb on them. There were already nuclear bombs on the airplanes, on the phantoms. These uh, Golda Meir, they had to make a decision. Moshe Dayan, the fool that called all the Arabs to come back to East Jerusalem, they already ran away. Moshe Dayan said, Chorban Bait Shlishi, the destruction of the third house meaning two temples were destroyed, that means the end of our, we're all going to die. This is the way the, the Minister of Defense speak in front of the media and say, this is the third destruction of Israel. And in the end, Hashem made us unbelievable miracles and we won. But what kind of a victory is that? Thousands of people dead, big damages. Shlomo Galil we lost. And by the way, even when we won, we never kept the achievement that we had. We right away gave it back to these monsters. For instance, it was up to me now. I would not leave one inch of Gaza in their hands. I would occupy the whole place. And what would I do? I would not leave one building over there. Nothing. Everything would go down and we keep it completely empty. Make a new border, run to Egypt and Jordan. That's where you belong. You cannot come back here. Every time you will attack us, you will, you will pay with massive amount of land. That's, by the way, what kills the Arabs the most, if you take their land. If you take their life, they don't care, they're happy. They give baklawa and candy. But if you take their land, they go crazy. Take one acre of their land, it kills them. That's all they think about. It kills them, they sit home and cry. They care, they, they become real monsters. Why? You took a little land from them. For whatever reason, Hashem drove them so crazy that for land, they're willing to burn the whole world. Just for land, land, land. Even Spain, they want Spain back. They was in Spain a few hundreds of years ago. They want Spain. They say Spain belongs to us. If they could, they would go into a war with Spain and take it. Any country they ever had position to control it, even for a week, according to their belief, must be theirs. They have to release this land. So, that's, what do you mean to go back? I'll never let you go back. Take back Gush Katif, send back all the people back to their homes, build them, let them build them home, every person get back his property. We give it to you as a gift. Instead, you shot um, thousands of missiles of us every day from the place we gave you, you will never get it back. Never. So, uh, we have to know how to deal with these monsters. The Torah tell you how to deal with them. Now we're going to learn how to deal with them from what we read in the shul on Shabbat. How do you go into a war with the enemy? The Torah is teaching you. Listen carefully. So Rabotai, Yaakov is afraid because Yaakov knows, today, yesterday I was righteous, today may, maybe I'm not so righteous. Maybe Hashem is upset with me. Maybe Esav will be able to hurt me. There's no guarantee. So he's afraid. Panic. Stressed. That's called tsar. Narrow. Everything becomes narrow. Now I want to read to you. How do you make a war? Yaakov preparing three things for the war with the Sav. One, a gift. Prepares a lot of animals to give him as a gift. What is this gift, really? What is it? Why you want to give your brother so many sheep and 
all these animals that you want to send him? The answer is, it's Bible. To calm him down. Bakshish, like the Arabs say, give Bakshish, we'll let you go. We won't kill you. These days are over, by the way. It used to be day, if an Arab comes to kill you, give him some money, he'll leave you alone. Not anymore. Today, I give him a million dollars, he'll still kill you. The, the drive to kill us, they, that makes them so happy to kill a Jew that it's better than winning the lottery. So, the second thing is tefillah. You cry to Hashem. You have a problem, you cry. You, you cry. What does it mean you cry? You read Tehillim, you pray, you ask, you beg, you make promises. If you save me, I'll do this and I'll keep that and I will improve here and I'll prove that. Do you know how many thousands of Israelis became Shomre Shabbat because of this tragedy? I'm sure you see all the videos. I saw hundreds of videos of complete lefties. People, bold people full of tattoos. You would never believe they're Jewish. They stand in front of the camera and tell the story how Hashem saved them against all odds. And in the last minute before they were getting thousands of bullets to their head from hundreds of terrorists, Face to face, they scream to Hashem, if you get me out of here, I accept on myself to be Shomer Shabbat. And all of a sudden, all the terrorists turn around and started to run. Mm-hmm. You should see this officer. He stands in front of a camera, him and his friend. He said, my friend eating barbecue on Yom Kippur. You cannot talk a word of religion to him. You know how much he hated religion? He cannot stand rabbis. One of these people, lefty liberals, haters of religion. He said to him, listen, uh, naturally, you and I, there's no chance for us to get out of here because we, uh, we ran out of bullets. Hundreds of them are coming closer and they're a few steps away from us. That's it. But I'm telling you now, test me on that. If we're going to get out of here, I'm becoming fully religious. <laughs> he said, I said to him, you religious? You cannot hear a word of religion. He said, yes, because right now, if we come out of here, I never ever questioned God again. And both of them got saved. And he said, the guy, this kibbutznik, became fully religious. Shomer Shabbat, Makpid, Kiddush, come to Shul. Do you know how many people became religious? Many. I heard over, Lefachot three, four hundreds came to my phone from videos that people sent. It's probably few tens of thousands in Israel. The question is, why do we have to wait for such a tragedy to remember we have Hashem and we have uh, guidelines and rules? Why we only have to wake up when we're going to end in York Avenue in uh, Clone, uh, Clone, uh, Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Department? Why? T- Over there, everyone is religious. In a war with the monster, everyone is religious. But when business is booming and everything is nice, all of a sudden we kick Hashem. It's not, it's not the right way to live. Person has to be devoted to Hashem when it's good, when it's bad, when it's tough, when it's easy, it doesn't matter. Unconditional relationship. So Yaakov prepared a gift and he's crying and praying to Hashem. And he also prepared for a war. So what did he do? He divided his family and all the people with him to groups. Why? If Esav will target one of the group, the other groups will have time to run to different direction. It's very clever. He's preparing for war. I don't know if he will accept the gift or not. I'll tell you, I'll tell you once a story. One person that I, Baruch Hashem, made in Baal Tshuva over 20 years ago, he was a master of investment, master of investment. He knew how to invest in the stock market, make good money. Really a, a real pro. One time, someone told him to buy a specific stock. I said to him, buy it and wait a week or two. Why? He said, it's going to go 30, 40 percent up. They have negotiation with a big company to buy them out. No one knows about it yet. It's called inside information. It's illegal in America. It's legal in Japan, in some other countries. In America, in Israel, it's not legal. Tov. That person went. He bought a lot of that stock. And 
I don't remember exactly how long after, just like the person said, it went up. The problem was that this company was a small company and no one trades so much in this company. So they have a security system that flags suspicious activity. For instance, if you have a company worth $50 million, that's considered a tiny company in Wall Street. If someone now buys, usually the validity of the stock in a day, let's say people buy a million stocks, buy and sell. All of a sudden you see one guy in one shot buy almost half a million. It's very suspicious. Because everybody buy 5,000 stocks, 2,000 stocks, 10,000 stocks, it's already very, who would buy so much? Boom, half a million stocks. Looks very suspicious. The system targeted. The system targeted. So the guy got a phone call from a person from the security department. The guy said to him, I'm watching you. I know exactly what you did. This is my name, this is my number, we will be in touch. He came to me, said, what do you think I should do? I said to him, you know, why did he call you this guy? I was supposed to right away come and do, make problems for you. Why did he call you? Why, did he, why you call someone and tell him I'm watching you? Meaning we can reach a solution without going into a war. Right? If you want to go and kill someone, you don't call him and warn him. If you talk to him, that means there is a solution. And exactly as I thought, that's how it was. But the idea is the same thing over here. You do not know what Esav is about to do. Maybe he's coming to kill me, so I have to prepare for war. If I die, I die with a fight. Maybe when I give him the, the ship, that's thousands of dollars, or tens of thousands of dollars a gift, it would make him not so angry at me, after all. Here, I'm paying you. You know, there was one Israeli hacker. One Israeli hacker, he, by the way, lives here in Queens. He once went into Chase Bank and took out $40 million out of their system and put it right back 15 minutes later. And then informed Chase Bank that the security system is not perfect. If they want to make it perfect, he can do it for them. Israeli hacker. Chase didn't like the trick informed to the FBI, arrested him, put him in jail. I remember one time I went to visit a big gangster here in a JFK jail. Someone asked me to come, said to me, if you make this gangster religious, do you know how many people will become religious here? He's in charge of many gangs, everyone look up to him. Now he's in jail, waiting for a big trial that can put him in life in prison. Come, give him a blessing, he should become uh, religious. We're going to start giving him books to make him religious. And if we make him religious, I'm promising you, there will be much less drugs in the streets of, of, of Queens. A lot of kids that died from drugs, he can clean it all out. No one will mess with him. It's a serious lunatic. I say, you know what, sounds very convincing. If I can make this guy religious, <laughs> save the life of so many kids who die from drugs, it's worth it for me. I went there, we spoke on the phone, you know, with the glass. He told me that next to him there is an Israeli guy. He told me the story. This guy became religious, this gangster. Baruch Hashem was able to make him Shomer Shabbat. They dropped the case. Supposed to go to life in prison. They dropped the case, he came out. When he came out, he told me the story. He said, I'm sitting here with a big hacker. Wow. So you know what happened in the end with this hacker? He was facing 20 or 30 years in prison. He said to the American government, what's the point of putting me in prison for 20, 30 years? Give me any fine you want. They fined him hundreds of millions of dollars. And he paid it. <laughs> It's all over Google. If I tell you his name, can Google it? See. 
He paid them hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't remember, 150, 250, 350, a big amount, unbelievable amount. It was all over the news. And they released him, but they're watching him. What did he do? He didn't steal anything. He took and paid back. According to Torah, by the way, what he did, it's a crime or no? A crime for 15 minutes. Once he returned what he stole, it's a bad tshuva. He repent. That's it. You're not allowed to do anything to him. According to the Torah, imagine this. You have a judge and he's a Jew. The Jew has a case like this. The FBI brings him to court. What did he do? He took $40 million out of the bank and 15 minutes later he put it back, which shows that he had no intention to steal. It's not a thief. He wanted just to get the contract. So he wanted to impress them that I have this ability. They didn't like this, they put them, you know, kill their ego. So now they, they trial him as a, some big bank robber, you know, it's a federal crime. According to the Torah, he will get a warning not to do it again. Once he gave it back, he'll leave him alone. He should not be in jail one day even, according to the Torah. Because the Torah says, It's called love and nitak la'aseh. You have love, you have a sin in the Torah, you committed that sin, there is sometimes a way to fix that sin. For instance, if you took an, an object that is not yours, you're holding it, you're upsetting your friend. He's looking for it, wow, someone stole my watch. You come the next day, I'm so sorry, forgive me for all the aggravation I caused you, I don't know what happened to me, I never stole, here, I'm, I'm, I apologize, take your watch back. Is 100% Sadiq. You're not even allowed to report it. You're not allowed to remind him ever that he stole the watch for one day. Why? Because he did tshuva, repented. This is what the Torah says. So now this judge will send him to 20 years in prison. Every day he will sit in prison. Who is going to be punished for it? That liberal judge. Why? Who told you to be a judge in a system of a court that is not against the Torah? You want to be a judge in a bed din, learn all the laws of the Torah, all which take you 30, 40 years, and then you'll be a judge in a bed din. You have bed din, dinem mamonot. Even some uh, big bate dinim, they don't judge dinem mamonot. They send to different bate dinim. If it's a complicated case. How many rabbis in the world do you have that they control 100% dinem mamonot? I know few personally. And mamash bekiim. Few, maybe four or five. Then, Mamash, every question you ask about laws, money, interest, robberies, these, uh, all kinds of delegations, that they are aware of the halachot. You know how many halachot you have in Choshen Mishpat? Maybe a million halachot, no exaggeration. You know how many books were written about financial cases? Tens of thousands of books, fixed like this. There is no end. You learn thousand years, you won't know Choshen Mishpat. You know how complicated it is? Most of the cases in Beddin are all rich settlements. The, the, the Rabbanim, the rabbis, they try to reach a settlement. Why? To actually make a verdict. It, we are not God, only he can make the right verdict. So they try to compromise, he will give up, he will give in. Yalla, let's reach an agreement and finish the case. Most of the cases are like this. You know the Chafetz Chaim? Chafetz Chaim. All of you heard about the Chafetz Chaim, a master of Lashon Hara, he has this famous book about Lashon Hara. Chafetz Chaim had a little grocery. He was selling bread, milk, cheese, olives. You know, grocery in those days was the size of the bathroom in. <laughs> Not like today, the supermarket, the size of two football fields. The eyes and the stomach <laughs> of the people are so greedy that the supermarket is growing every generation more and more and more. But when I was a kid, all the makolet in Israel was the size of this bathroom. I remember going to the makolet. There was few shelves with bread, few donuts on the counter, which always was making me eat my heart. Few cold cuts. It takes from the fridge and cut in the machine, manually like this, <laughs> rolling. Later they brought the electric one. 
in the refrigerator he had a big can of olives and some Israeli feta cheese, salty squares, yellow cheese that they cut, sliced, and few beastly bamba, the whole supermarket, no exaggeration, the size of that bathroom there. It'll be tiny bit better. That's it. The whole area is eating from that supermarket. So there you go. Wow, you have shelves, so many snacks, just thousands of snacks. <laughs> you go with your child to the supermarket, you drive him crazy. <laughs> He's already a mental case before he came out to the world. Why? He has so many things to choose from. He doesn't know what to choose. So the Chafetz Chaim had a little grocery a hundred years ago. And he closed it down. Who knows why he closed it down? You're not going to believe it. He said, I came to the conclusion it's impossible to own a store without failing with stealing. Impossible. No matter how careful you are, the one mistake you make a month, you steal from someone innocent, you made a mistake in a weight or something, or you gave a product that was not 100% fresh, the person didn't return it. So, you know what, I lose $5, I lose $10. Half a time, say, I better not own a business. Why? I don't want to steal a penny in my life. Today, who cares about stealing? Allah, no, ma, no big deal. It's a part of a business. No, no. He was so afraid, every penny. I don't want one dollar in my hand to be not clean. So careful. So, Rabotai, we just learned from the Torah how you go to a war. First, you offer a gift to your enemies. We'll give you this, leave us alone. It may work. It didn't work. While you give them a gift, you obviously pray non-stop. The prayers are very powerful, can turn everything to the positive side. And if it didn't help the prayers and the gift offer, you go into a war with no mercy on your enemy. No mercy. But when you go, you give them one direction to escape. You do not surrender them from all directions. You do not. You allow them one side that they can run away. They can surrender by running away. But when they run away, you don't bring them back. That's it. It's your land. You don't give it back to them. Today, obviously, the army, they're not following the laws of the Torah. Not for good, not for bad. When they need to be cruel, they soft. When they need to be merciful, they cruel. Why? They don't know the laws. They don't know the laws. One terrible thing happened two days ago. There was an attack in Jerusalem, terror attack. They started to shoot people on the street. They killed a rabbi from the Beddin and a woman that was the head of a seminary. And one Israeli guy had a gun, he's from the reserve, Israeli citizen, Jew. Shot the Arabs and killed them. If he wasn't there, there would be 30, 40 dead. Two Arabs start shooting at people, you know, with automatic weapon. By a miracle, Hashem always arranged that at least one citizen have a gun in the area. And he comes and kills the Arabs. It always ends with few dead, instead of dozens. After he killed the Arabs, one Israeli religious soldier, with peot, I saw his picture. He came and shot him and killed him. He thought he's one of the terrorists. But people said that the, the Israeli went down on his knees, put the gun down, and said to him, come check my Israeli ID. I'm an Israeli, I'm a Jew. And he shot him anyway. Why, is, why did he shoot, shoot him? He wanted to kill a Jew? Of course not. The panic drives people mad. Panic, you can't you can think. When you panic, you can't think. If you drive on a highway and a police pull you over at 2 a.m. at night and you know this is very tough police, New Jersey, very, very tough, arrogant sometimes, you don't even, you can't even find your registration paper or the insurance, in front of your eyes. Your hands are shaking. Wow, wow. The, you don't know what to expect from them. They can pull you over from the car, did that. When you are under stress and panic, the brain freezes. 
People are so in so pa such panic that the guy is on his knees like this, and he shot him and killed him. So there was his funeral. Now they arrested that Israeli soldier, the religious one. They're going to send him to jail for negligence, for killing, unintentional killing. But still, it could be two years in prison. If you send him to prison, what's going to happen in the next attack? No one would want to pull their gun out. What do I need this headache for? Let me run away from my life. But he's going to kill 20 Jews. It's not my business. The last one who came to try to kill the Arabs, killed by mistake a Jew, and they sent him to prison. Why they want to send him to prison? Because when a person is on their knees and his hands are up, you're not supposed to shoot him. True or false? If a Hamas terrorist who just killed 50 Israelis in front of your eyes, you come to shoot him and he goes down on his knees like this. You allowed to shoot him or not, according to the Torah? You must kill him. You don't let him go to prison and eat now 20 years Lebanon, olive oil and za'atar with Iraqi pita and kebab and watch soccer games. What is this? If we had executions by the court, okay, we'll kill him in the next month. Since there's no executions, what's going to be? It's going to sit. And in three months, you have to release him because they'll kidnap another Israeli and you have to release this monster and they will kill again. To make sure he will not have a chance to kill again, you don't let him a chance to ever go back. By the way, you should know all this attack all the people who are behind this attack are the terrorists that were released in the Gilad Shalit deal. Sinwar, I have a video, I can show you. They reported that in Israeli TV many years ago. They started to name all of them. Israel Sinwar murder Israelis. The other one, murder Israeli. One guy drove a bus into the, in down the hill, killed many Israelis. Every one of the terrorists they released actually killed Israelis. They released 127 murderers for one soldier. I wonder how he feels, this Gilad Shalit, when he see what happened in Israel because of his deal. I wonder what he thinks. Because all the people that died now, it's because of the stupid decision of the Israeli government back then, that you don't ever negotiate with terrorists. Everyone say it, but in the end they negotiate with terrorists. It has to be a solid rule. The terrorists would know that no one ever talked to them. They will never kidnap. They would do much less terror attacks because they have nothing to gain. Right now, a lot of the kidnapping is just to release prisoners from jail and wait what's waiting for us. They're only releasing our little children and some old lefty women, women that they like that were fighting for them, you know, helping them, bringing them to hospital. These kind of women they release. All the soldiers they're not releasing. They're holding the soldiers. What do you think is going to happen when you're going to have to release 50 or 100 soldiers? I don't know how many they have exactly. They're going to ask 10,000 prisoners for it. Till now, they don't care. Release one for three. They don't care about the women. It's a big headache for them to feed these old women and children. They want to get rid of them. But the soldiers, each soldier, they're going to ask for 1,000 terrorists. And the foolish Israeli government, what do you think they're going to do? Same story. There's nobody to talk to. Same story. There's going to be all the lefty media brainwashing the people. We have to release him. We have to release the prisoner. Again, they release all these monsters from jail. Don't be surprised if the people who went and shot thousands of Jews now, over a thousand Jews, they will release in two, three years. The only reason it will happen is because they took them and allowed them to leave. They should have not done it. You take 10, 20, you get information from them, and that's it. You don't fill up the jail with another 500 monsters. You have to feed them. It costs thousands of dollars every hour to feed them. And they eat like camels. They eat a lot. It's not like us. We eat one little bread, tiny meal a day. You see how much they eat? They eat a lot. You have to feed them. You have to give. If you don't feed them, they burn the mattresses. They violate. In jail, it's very, very scary to be around them. 
Everyone is afraid of them. The people inside the jail, I spoke to them. I am speaking in Israeli jails when I go to Israel. Tell me you don't want to start with them. We hope every day that they'll be quiet. There's nothing you can do with them. What are you going to do? You're going to shoot them and kill them? You're going to get into trouble. Everyone is afraid. This is all written in the Torah, in Parashat Bechukotai. The enemy among you will be like cancer, spreading, destroying you from inside. And you will be weak and helpless, and you won't be able to do anything. You will sink and you will rise. All of that, why? Because you don't listen and you don't follow my Torah. That's why everywhere we live, Hashem sends the Arab right next to us. You came to Brooklyn, immediately they come. You came to Queens, immediately they come. You go to Muncie, immediately they come to Spring Valley, next town. You go to Toronto, immediately Muslim Center. Did you ask yourself what's going on here? The answer is Hashem will not leave us alone. He wants this Goim to be our guards, like a policeman. And we see that they want to come and kill us, we remember that we have a father in heaven. Everyone is almost not religious in Israel. A lot of lefties started to put fill in for the first time in their life. You know how many videos I saw, I could not believe it. A guy, you don't have one inch of his body without tattoos. Everywhere, everywhere, in his hands, in his fingers. Would never believe a guy like this, earrings everywhere. Shomer Shabbat, his wife covered the head, not with a wig. Full cover, mikveh, tarat mishpacha, fully religious Shomer Shabbat. The way they saved is an unbelievable story. Rabotai, so now we learn how you go into a war. If you have mercy on monsters, you deserve to be killed by them. That's what the Torah says. Someone who has mercy on murderers will be cruel to the righteous people. It cannot be that you have mercy on righteous people and on wicked people at the same time. If you will have mercy on Nazis, Hashem will make you hate the righteous. All the people who fought for the Hamas hate rabbis and hate Haredim, hate religious people. You wonder, how can it be? They rather help these monsters and not helping Bahurim that learn Torah and give their life for holiness? You love this monster? And you hate the rabbi that all his life try to be righteous? Yes. I can only love one of the two. I chose to, lo to love the monster. I cannot love the rabbis. You cannot love one thing and the opposite of it at the same time. It doesn't work that way. So Rabotai, Yaakov now finally come and he meet Esav. What's the first thing he told him? I was 20 years with Lavan and I stayed religious. Im Lavan garti v'taryag mitzvot shamarti. I don't get it. You have a murderer is waiting for so many years to come kill you. 34 years he waited. Finally he arrives with 400 mercenaries with their swords. You have one minute to leave. What's the first sentence you say to your monster brother? I lived 20 years with Lavan and I stayed religious. I kept all the mitzvot. The last thing you want to send to such a wicked person that you are religious. If it would be today, the first thing a person would do, take away his keeper. Doesn't want the antisemite, the hater of the Jew, to get even angrier, see that I'm a religious Jew. At least let me try to pretend I'm one of you. I'm like you, like a goy. You, you don't keep Shabbat, I don't keep Shabbat. You eat whatever you want, I eat whatever. We are brothers. We have the same ideology. If you see me with the beard, the hat, you know, peot, you know, I'm religious, tzitzit, it makes you angrier. Especially if you come to this hater and say to him, by the way, you should know I stay religious even though I lived in the house of the crook. What is the secret here, Maya? Kov chas v'shalom is done? The last thing Esav cared about is religion. If he wanted to be religious, he would be religious. He grew up in the same house with Yitzhak Avinu. You get the question or no? Who can give me an answer? You should have not talked about spirituality, ma. You're meeting a, you're meeting a, 
a person who's a hater of religion. The last thing you want is to start bringing quotes from the religion. It makes him angrier by the moment. You know, it's the Chazal say it. Al tocheach let's penis neka. Someone that acts like a clown, meaning wicked clown, don't rebuke him. It's only going to make things worse. Same thing, you're not allowed to rebuke someone in a time of anger. It's fuming, it's red, it's sweating, he wants to kill someone. Hey, the Torah says you're not allowed to get angry. <laughs> Do you know what happened to his anger? It became ten times more. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. There was one Moroccan guy, you know, tough guy. He said to his wife, I'm going to shul Friday night. He put the fan, you know. That's before there was air conditioning in every house, in the old days. I put the fan, I lock the fan on my seat. Be careful, don't press the button that the fan will move left and right. I want to have a nice breeze when I come and you sweat and the rest of the guests. She said, okay, okay, Moshe, no worry, Seder. I know, I know. He comes back to shul. The fan is going left and Ma! I told you don't touch the fan! So I swear I, I didn't touch the fan. You lying to me? She said, no. From the minute you left, the fan loves you so much, he was looking for you. <laughs> <laughs> he was looking for you. You know, in life you have to be clever. You have to have the right answer in the right time. So anyway, Rabotai, why Yaakov say to Lavan, I want you to remember, to know that I stayed religious all these years. The answer is, Rabotai, first, even though I live with a very wicked crook, he did not break me. What makes you think you can break me? That's one possibility. The other possibility is, the other possibility is, our father gave me a blessing and gave you after that a blessing. What's your blessing? You would live by your sword. But the blessing is very specific. You will be able to hurt the Jews. Esav is the father of the Romans, the Greeks, the Nazis, Haman, Haman, all the evil people in the world are the children of Esav. The Nazis and the Jews came from the same womb of Rivka. Yaakov and Esav, the Jews and the Nazis came from the same delivery. First baby came out, Esav, the Nazi. And the Jew is holding his heel, Yaakov, that's why his name is Yaakov, he, he was holding Akev, Akev means a heel, Yaakov, Yaakov means to follow, Okev means to follow, civilians. The Jews and the Nazis came from the same mother, that was before Judaism. No wonder Hitler in an in interview said, the world has one battle. Everything else is a background and illusion. The world has one battle between us and the Jews. Everything else is meaningless. The Jews put two defects in the world, in humanity. One in a body and one in a soul. In the body, circumcision. Baby is born, they cut a piece from his body. He calls it a defect, this food. That makes the person perfect, the circumcision. And he looked at that as, as a defect. And in the soul, the Jews invented the term conscious. All the time, to be worried. If you sin, you'll be punished. If you do this, God is watching. Fear! Fear from God, that's called conscious. Worry, what should I do? I should not touch without permission. I should not speak gossip. I should not hurt anyone. I should have mercy on the handicaps. I should not be a racist. This is all Jewish inventions. They ruin our plans, the Aryans. We want to kill all handicaps. They are a burden to society. We don't want to feed them. 
You're born autistic, will kill you. You're born down syndrome, will kill you. You're born without a hand or you walk crooked, will kill you. You're gay, will kill you. You're black, will kill you. You're Jew, will kill you. 90% of the people almost, they want to kill. Later, they would say, if you're ugly, we'll kill you also. It was just a matter of time. They even made a brochure, how you're supposed to look. They took a blonde boy, I think 13 years old, and they made a picture of a perfect Aryan look and a Jewish look. Two pictures. So they chose someone ugly, here, this is the Jew, and they chose someone very pretty face, handsome face, this is an Aryan. <laughs> the big joke is that the, the, the Aryan was actually a Jew. <laughs> but of course nobody cares about the truth. So what do you see over here? He, he couldn't live with this all the time, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, be careful, God is watching, there's a reward, punishment. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't take it. We want to do, the, the strong one in nature has to be dominant, has to control. We cannot have mercy on the, on the miserable. We do not want all kinds of uh, kind, uh, uh, you know, activities. That's not our way. We want to be strong and defeat everyone. Hitler didn't want to shake the hand of Jesse Owens, an athlete, black athlete. Refused to shake his hand. In Iran, the same thing. In some of the places in Iran, when a Jew come to a store to buy something, they didn't want to take the money from his hand. Put the money on the counter, you dirty Jew. That's what they used to say. Put the money, and the Jew puts the money, and they give him whatever he wants. They won't refuse the, the money. They just don't want to take it from the hand of a Jew. But they don't know, some of these Goim don't understand that the only blessing comes to the land only when the Jews live there. Every country who occupied the Jews and sent them to exile. The Jews went to Romi, Romi was a huge empire. They went to Babylon in Babel, that's where the Talmud was written, Talmud Bavli. Babylon was the empire of the world. The Greeks, the Greeks were the, the power of the world. In Germany, the Jews were in power. Germany was the biggest empire. They killed the Jews and sent them out. Boom. Germany became another country. In Russia, when the Jews were there, hundreds of thousands of Jews, they were USSR, strong, the strongest country in the world. No one would mess with them. Boom. They broke to 12 countries. Everyone got their independence. Russia became a very poor place now. It's nothing special what it was. They will never go back to their glory days. In Spain and Portugal, when the Jews were there, they were the empire of the world. Once they killed the Jews or sent them away, boom, they became nothing. They took bankrupt countries. Mm -hmm. Everywhere, Venezuela, same thing, everywhere there were Jews. Once they either killed them or sent them away, their glory days were over. Even in the Arab countries, Iraq, Iran. There were hundreds of thousands of Jews in Iran before Khomeini came. All were wealthy, all were smart, academic. They helped, the Iran was the fourth successful country in the world, better than France. They went back a thousand years in time. There's no, you can't even get Advil there on a, on a shelf. There's nothing you can buy there. It's, cra it's crazy how primitive it became. Once the Jews leave, Hashem take away the blessing from the place. Let them eat each other alive. Same thing will happen here in America, just a matter of time. The Jews will have to run away from here. The antisemitism here is on a serious rise. Antisemitism can be tolerated as long as it's not turned into violence. The problem with violence is that it can happen overnight, like the Kristallnacht. There was a lot of talking until it happened. Once it happened, they burned more than 1,200 synagogues in one day. Once it's going to happen, no one can stop it. Not police, not FBI. And today it's a million times more dangerous in the time of Kristallnacht because there was no social media back then. Do you know what it takes to bring million Nazis to the street to start burning Jewish property in the old days? You need such organization. It's almost impossible to orchestrate such thing. 
But today, all it needs is a few messages on social media, and it's accelerating a week or two, and that's it. And social media owns by who? Liberal lefty Jews. Liberal lefty Jews. Zuckerberg, Google, all of them Jews. They will bring Chas V'Shalom the destructions of the Jews here. Trump wanted to open one, but I don't think it succeeded. Musk? Elon Musk? Which one? Elon Musk is, uh, some say he's anti-Semite, some say he's not. He, was, he went to Israel now. Uh, the NBA basketball player that Baruch Hashem I was able to make him religious, the Israeli one, took him to Israel. He met with Netanyahu and they took him to see what happened in the South. And they showed him that horrible movie. It's a movie they never published. Because if, if ever anyone would see this movie, he will never ever be able to function ever again. They show it in Belgium, in, uh, in other countries, to the parliament. The Goim went crazy. Goim were crying. They show how the Goim all crying. Ministers in the government, Goim. Children of Esav were crying. Imagine even some of them are big anti-Semites. They just couldn't believe how they were burning children, how they were cutting parts from their body, how they put a kid in the oven and turn it on and laugh while their parents are watching. Things that they did. I doubted that the Nazis did such cool things like they did. Cutting hands, cutting in front of the parents. Did horrible things. Forget about the raping and all the other things that they did. So when they show the film to all these anti-Semites, at least you keep them quiet for X amount of time. In a month or two, they'll go back to barking. Again. But for now, they are relatively quiet. Relatively quiet. If they wouldn't show them that film, I don't think they would let us continue with the war. The war is already more than two months. And there's two more months to go, the, the head of the army said. At least two more months. When did you have a head of war, a war with four months and the world will let you continue your, your plan, your mission? Impossible. The pressure will be tremendous. You know pressure, all you need is the United States to tell you you must stop and that's it, there's nothing you can do. You're not going to go into war with America now. We have thousands of projects together with America. They, all they do, they stop sending you bombs. That's it, there's nothing you can do. Without the Air Force, the Israeli army, as good as it is, he can never win a, a guerrilla war. That they're coming from the ground and put booby traps. There's no way to win such a war. It will take hundreds of years to clear all the tunnels. Eh, it's impossible. So they have to attack. They have bombs that can go down 30, 40, 50 meters in the ground. If you remember, a few months, a few weeks ago, I said that if it was up to me, I would flood all the tunnels. As I was right next to the ocean. Just flood the tunnels. Baruch Hashem, today, finally, I spoke to a few people in the government. Baruch Hashem, they had a meeting. They're going to do it. They're going to flood all the tunnels. If we have a schut in it, all of us here, it's already Baruch Hashem. That's what you should do. Why you should let soldiers die? Flood it. They run like mouse. They run outside. When they see water coming in their tunnels and flooding them, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> They're going to have to run out. They're not going to have food, nothing. That's it. They run out. And you know what to do when they come out. I'm afraid to say it, you know, YouTube regulations. <laughs> That's why we have humble. They're not liberals there. Anyway, Rabotai, let's move on. Time is running out. We have a few more minutes. So the answer is, Esav, Yaakov said to Esav, you have no reason to kill me. The blessing that our father gave you is that you will control me if I am not religious. If Yaakov is going down spiritually, you have permission to hurt him. That's the blessing that Yitzchak gave to Esav. But if he stayed religious, you have no permission to touch him. That's why the first thing Yaakov say, you are 
the number one person in respecting the, pa the father. No one in the world, in the history, respected his father like Esav, the Gemara say. The Gemara say, no matter how much you think you did for your parents, the Gemara brings few of the rabbis who they traded their parents like kings and queens. And the Gemara say, no matter how much you did for your father or your mother, you still have a long way until you get to the level of Esav. This mitzvah he was very good at, respecting his father. Kibud Ori. So, you respect the father, right? You do not want to do something against the blessing of the father. So our father said that you can only hurt me if I'm not religious. I want to make sure that you understand that I'm fully religious. I kept all the laws. Top, very nice. You see, Esav is not touching him. But one question I have, how exactly Yaakov kept 613 commandments? Do you know one person in the history of the world that kept 613 commandments? The answer, there was no such person, for very simple reason. Some of the mitzvot doesn't apply to regular Jews, apply only to Kohanim. If you're not a Kohen, you cannot keep it. For instance, Birkat Kohanim. I'm not a Kohen, I cannot do Birkat Kohanim. Right there, I lost one mitzvah. It's not my mitzvah. If you're a boss, you have specific mitzvot. If you're not a boss, you don't have employees, you don't have beomot and schavo. You don't have this. You don't have, you don't pay salaries to anyone. You can keep that. A woman, nida, it's only a woman. You're not a woman, you don't have it. So there's some mitzvot you can only keep if you're Kohen or Levi or a woman or a man or a boss. But, but, there's also Mitzvot that you can only keep in Bet HaMikdash, and there was no Bet HaMikdash. Hundreds of mitzvot from the 613 mitzvot are only in the house of God in Jerusalem. Only in Bet HaMikdash, all the sacrifices. So Yaakov, even at best case scenario, if you wanted to be fully religious, maybe you can keep a hundred mitzvot. So what does it mean, Taryag mitzvot shamarti? Huh? Very good. He didn't say Taryag mitzvot kiyamti. Kiyamti means I kept. Shamarti means I observe. What's the difference between kept and observe? Observe you can fulfill by learning. You learn about it. It's count like you did it. You learn about it. You learn about it all the time. You learn, you learn. Today, what do we do? We learn every day about the sacrifices. Where? In Tfilat Shachrit. Elu mekomam shel zvachim, kodshe kodashim. We read all these things in the Tfilah. Why do we need to read it? We don't have Bet Mikdash for 2,000 years. When we have Bet Mikdash, we'll learn it again. Why do we have to say it every morning in the Tfilah? Oh, that's exactly the point. That because we don't have the temple, if we don't learn it, few generations will pass, no one will know anything. When finally Bet HaMikdash will be built, not one Kohen will know what to do. So now we are putting it as an integral part of the Jewish prayers in the morning. Then everyone will know it by heart after a few months that he prays. And now you don't even need to learn it because you know it by heart. All the different kinds of sacrifices. Also when we eat bread, we have to wash our hands to do Netilat Yadayim. Jews that are not Kohanim, the Torah doesn't say you have to wash your hands when you eat bread. Only Kohanim that eat holy bread inside Bet HaMikdash, they have to eat it with Tahara when they are pure. They're not allowed to do it with the impure. That's why they have to wash their hands. But now after the temple was destroyed, who knows when it's going to be built. Two temples were destroyed, we're going to exile now. The Romans burned Bet HaMikdash. They sent it to Romy, to Italy over there. It could be hundreds of years until we will be able to build the house of God again in Jerusalem. What's gonna happen? By the time it will happen, no one will remember this law, that you cannot eat this bread if your hands are impure. So we are making a decree from now on, everyone who eats bread must wash their hands. Kohen, not Kohen, it becomes a way of life. Like this, when the time comes, no one will dis dis desecrate the, the temple. Why? So the Chachami made a lot of very clever decrees to reserve and observe the, the decrees of Hashem. And it's written in the Torah that God said to the Chachamim, Le'asu mishmeret lemishmarti, make a fence around my fence. One fence sometimes will not be enough. Let's say you, wanna, you have a bomb now in a field. You go and you make one fence around it and you put a sign, don't enter. 
minefield. But some fools, they jump, they want to make a shortcut, they jump over the fence and go. What do they do? Make a, another fence. Another one, and very tall. That you don't even get to the original fence. What's the purpose of the big fence? To make sure you don't come to the small fence. The Torah gave fence, a fence. If you see it's not enough, Hashem said to the Chachamim, make another fence. For instance, for the first 300 years since we got the Torah, no man will ever commit a sin with a woman unless they got married. No man will touch a woman unless it's his wife. There's no such thing. People have intimacy if they're not married. No. Once King David, 3,000 years ago, saw that some people are not as modest as it was until now, he started to get nervous. People are about to have intimacy without marriage. The Yetzirah is boiling between men and women. It's boiling. What would happen? A man will touch a Jewish woman that she's nida, she's impure, she never went to the mikveh. It's a horrible sin. I have to prevent it. From now on, a man and a woman cannot isolate themselves in an isolated place. You want to speak to a woman? Make sure there's windows, the door is unlocked. You, can lock, you cannot lock yourself with a woman in a place that no one has access to. It's called Yichud. The Torah didn't say it. For 300 years, everything was fine. But once they saw that maybe people are not as pure as they used to be, not holy, not modest, they made a decree. They made a decree. What is the decree? Ichud. You're not allowed. You have to make sure a husband is on, in town. If you come, you knock on your friend's house. I, is Moshe there? No. He will be back in an hour. You don't sit, go inside and sit and drink coffee with his wife. I'll come back in an hour. According to the Torah, you are allowed to go in. You see, it, you, if you serve with something to eat, no problem. But that was when everyone was very holy. Today, Hashem Irachem, if, if you allow something like this, you know how many tragedies will happen? How many families will, will be broken? If you don't trust what I say, just go and see how many people's life was destroyed on Facebook alone. Facebook, between women, these, putting pictures, you know what's happening today in the world? A disaster. So many thousands of families fell apart just from exposure, texting, men, women at places of work, social media, WhatsApp, groups. Disaster. The world is not the same since social media came out. Hundred times more terrorism, hundred times more anti-Semitism, hundred times more divorce cases, hundred times more hatred between everyone, everyone hates everyone. Terrible lack of morality and ethics, all teenagers are drug addicts, weirdos, hands of tattoos, behave like zombies. Social media is the poison of the world, it destroys the world. There's nothing to compare the world 30 years ago to today. The, the, the world went down thousands of levels, spiritually. Today, if you're secular, you have to be super, super crazy to get married. Super crazy. It will only bring you horrible experience in your life. Because almost everyone gets divorced, and the marriage is terrible, and people cannot be faithful to each other because all day they're in social media, and they watch horrible things. It drives their mind crazy and it destroys the family as it is, and then they end up in court, and the lawyers clean away all their money with hundreds of thousands with their greed, and they have to go to some liberal judge who decide if they see their children or not. From the minute they got married, their life became hell. While they were married, and once they went into divorce. You gotta be stupid, what are you, secular? What do you care about getting married? You believe in God? You don't believe in God. Who told you to get married? You live like an animal. Animals don't get married. They go. A chimpanzee have five females. Today goes to her, tomorrow to her. Everything is fine. He doesn't need to marry to one of them. Do you know that some rabbis, when they go to married secular people, on purpose they bring one head that is Mechalel Shabbat. Because a Jew that is not Shomer Shabbat in Halacha is not considered a Jew. The way to become Jewish, you need two conditions, that your mother is Jewish and you must be Shomer Shabbat. 
So if a non-Shomer Shabbat Jew sign on a, on a ketubah, the person is not married. Officially is not married. If he will have kids, they're not mamzerim. They are out of the marriage, illegitimate kids, but not mamzerim. Mamzer means from married woman, brother and sister, things like that. But this is a, a Jew and a Jewish woman. They had a child without marriage. This child is not mamzer. He can go get married, no problem. The problem is that the rabbi says since there's so much cheating and so much garbage in today's marriages, better they won't be married. Why? Because if he's a married woman, you take her, she's married, both witnesses were Shomer Shabbat, she's officially married. If she go with someone else, it's that penalty. So they make sure at least one witness will be Mechalel Shabbat. Once the witness is Mechalel Shabbat, she's not married, she's actually a single woman. Like boyfriend and girlfriend. One day they leave each other, then she doesn't need the get. Sometimes they go to bed in, the guy doesn't want to give get. Doesn't want to give a get. Macho. I want a hundred thousand dollars. Let your father pay me to give you get. You know me, you don't give me a hundred thousand, I don't give the get. Wow, go and beg him now, give the get. No. What do the rabbi do? They check the ketubah. They begin to investigate. If they find out one of the witnesses who signed away was not Shomer Shabbat, they say to him, go to hell. We don't need your get. Get lost. Why? She was never married to you. Why? One of the witnesses was Mechalel Shabbat. The marriage never took place. That's why they do it. Why? Because they already know, they see what's happening. The world became a zoo. It's not a world of people anymore. People behave worse than animals. Even animals have more rules than us. Look what happened to the world. Unfortunately, so Rabotai, I just want to finish with this. Yaakov said to Lavan, to Esav, you don't have to hate me. All the blessing of my father did not happen to me. He blessed me to have minerals and oils. I don't have oil, I have sheep. I don't need your land. The land is yours. You're going to get all the oil. Italy, all these places, Greece, it's all Esav, all the good olive oils. It's all yours. You don't have to worry. I'm not your competition. So... And plus, I'm religious. You have no permission to kill me. If I left the Torah, then you're right. You, you, the blessing of the Father, that when I'm down, you can kill me. In the end, Rabotai, Esav make peace with Yaakov. And I just want to ask you one question. From the minute they made peace, right? What does Esav want to do now? What does Esav want to do? He wants to stay together with Yaakov for good. Okay, let's be brothers. When Yaakov was praying, what did he say to Hashem? Atzileni na miyad achi miyad esav. Save me please from my brother, from esav. What do you need to say for my brother, from esav? Everyone knows it. You either say, save me from esav, or save me from my brother. He doesn't have other brothers. You don't need to say both. There's no extra word in the Torah. If you say, save me from my brother, and I have only one brother, Hashem knows which brother. If I say, save me from Esav, everybody knows who Esav is. Why do I have to say, save me from my brother, save me from Esav? Twice, save me. Save me from the anti-Semite goyim that come and hug me like a brother, and then they stick the knife in my back. I won't be alert. Save me from this kind of anti-Semite. They smile in the elevator. How you doing? Then they go on Twitter and say that to all Jews. Yeah, please save me from those hypocrites. And save me from, my, from when Esav come to be my brother. Hi, what's up, Jacob? What's up, Jake? Let's go, let's go eat some hummus here in Main Street. Ah, when I'm uh, off guard, psh, he take off the knife and that's the end of me. Save me from Esav when he's Esav, the hunter, the murderer. Save me from the anti-Semite terrorist. Save me from the anti-Semite reporters. 
One זה נבלה זה טרפה, one is a killer, the other one kills with a keyboard. This is why it's written there are two forms of his Sometimes he comes as a Christian missionary. What's up, brother? JC love you so much. We heard you struggle with your mortgage payment. That's why we came to help you. Aren't we all brothers? Come Sunday, we have a lecture in a church. We will have a check ready for you. That's my brother. Save me from my brother. He pretends to be my brother. He wants to hunt my soul. Save me from the terrorists who come and shoot or put SWAT sticker on my thing and throw fire into my backyard to burn my house. Which one of the two is more dangerous? Save me from my brother or save me from myself? Save me from my brother, meaning he comes to hunt my soul. Save me from Esav, he comes to kill my body. What does the Gemara say? Gadol amachtiyo, yoter min haorgo. Someone who jeopardizes your soul is a lot worse than jeopardizing your body. It's about time we get the point already. We sometimes think, oh, they're going to kill our body. Okay, nobody wants to die. But that's not the biggest problem. Uh, much, much bigger if they're going to turn your children into Mechalilei Shabbat. The children will be full of tattoos, drug addicts, don't believe in anything, don't pray, no tefillin, no nothing. That's much, much more dangerous. So Esav Rabotai, he wants to stay with Yaakov. And what does Esav say? What does Yaakov say? Ah, I can't, oh, I don't want to delay you. Move on. <laughs> He's dying to get rid of him. Why? No, my children, this, they cannot. They cannot keep up with your people. I mean, you have 400 mercenaries. What, are they going to wait for my children and my women to walk? It's not realistic. What does Yaakov have in mind? Every second you are next to me, it's danger to my family. Brother, Rabbi, it's my brother. I want to invite him for Lela Seder. One holiday your brother will be by you, it's the end of your children. One, one holiday. 48 hours in your house. They'll see him with his tattoos, they see him without kippah, they see him smoking, they see him cursing. I don't have to tell you the culture of the secular people today. Every other world is F this, F that. That's, that's what comes out of their mouth. That's what they talk. Presidents talk like this. Presidents of companies talk like this. Teachers in school speak like this. Forget it. It's not the old days where people have integrity. So the world became a nightmare. Your own brother can destroy your children with his phone. Show them things in the phone. You want to see my girlfriend, Christina? You like her? Little kid with a perot from yeshiva here. That's it. Abba, he has a girlfriend, Christina? Uh, no, go and fix down the what poison already put in his mind. What is, what is your job? I'm a hitman. Abba, what's a hitman? Uh, it's not important right now. You get the point or no? What's your job? Malve very beat. What's your job? I'm collector. What's your job? I train women in a gym. What jobs he may have? What jobs he may have? If you're lucky, he has a kosher job. But forget about the job. About the job. It's much, much, much. I had in Sukkot one time a family from Long Island. They asked me if I can invite them from my house for Sukkot. And I said, fine. A father, a mother, a boy and a girl. Very wealthy family. They are, they are, the father owned a big real estate office. So they came by me, and we wanted to do Kiddush in a sukkah. And the boy came with the machine gun, you know, these plastic machine guns that makes noise. <laughs> he runs in my house looking for terrorists. <laughs> if he'll find some Hamas to shoot. I feel awkward. My kids, what do they know about these things? Guns, this, that, from yeshiva. Say, kasher avadnu, avadnu. Anyway, why am I remembering this? And we finish with this story. 
The father, I see how in poor guy, how he's embarrassed. The parents already became Shomer Shabbat in a seminar. We had them in our seminar. That's why we invite them after to show them how to keep the holidays. And he begs his son, I don't remember what was his name, Asaf, Eyal, something like that. Asaf, come to the table. Israeli family, the father is in, on the real estate. The boy ignore. Runs, ninja. Pa, 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 pa. Top. After maybe, I don't know, five, six attempts, the whole family standing, waiting for the start of Kiddush, Friday night, Erev, Erev, Erev Yom Tov. The father raised his voice. Come to the table! Guess what happened next? There was a shoe on the floor in the kitchen. The deck is attached to the kitchen. From the kitchen you go right into the deck, that's where the sukkah is. He grabbed the, the shoe, he was maybe six years old, seven years old. Threw it in his father's face, by a miracle it missed his head in front of all the guests. Wow, I felt so bad for that father. Public school, a product of public school, seven years old, second grade. Throw a shoe at his father's face. Go to all the Hasidim in the world, Nachman, Yoeli. Ask them if it ever happened in the history that a seven years old boy from Yeshiva picked up a shoe and threw it in his father. If it ever happened in the history, ask. It never happened, and Baruch Hashem probably will never happen. Why? Depends on how you raise children, what do you think? There's no hocus pocus. You raise them with internet, you raise them with garbage, you raise them with pictures that they're not supposed to see. This is what you're going to get. You raise them in a conservative environment, you watch what they see. My kids, for years, the only guy they saw in their life was the mailman. We lived in a neighborhood with all Hasidim, Klosenburg, Tzans. All the kids were Hasidim, speak Yiddish. My kids couldn't even have some friends there because the kids, most of them spoke in Yiddish. So people ask me, why do you need to live in such a neighborhood? You're not a Hasid. Move to a more modern. There are Americanized religious kids. So what do I need? Everything is very strict here, Baruch Hashem. No pretzels, no women walking here. Private place, wonderful. Other places, modern lifestyle, bring problems. The only guy you see in the neighbor was the male men. There was no male women back then. Just the male men. That's it. Why? You watch the environment. On the other hand, you have to prepare your kids that there are all kinds of creatures out there. You don't want them to find out when they're 18 that the world is a zoo. You have to teach them a lot about the world. You have to warn them from pedophiles. You have to warn them from all kinds of attackers. If they ever, you know, go to places, you know, camp, this, you have to, you have to prepare them from the horrible world. Because pure, innocent kids, they may not be aware of what's out there. Very easy, someone can take advantage of them. And plus, you have to teach your kids on the Shabbat table all the time proofs that the Torah is divine. Don't take it for granted because they learned Mara that they believe that the Torah is 100% divine, that the words of Chazal, it's all from Hashem. No, 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 no. All you need that one secular, wicked person will start brainwash your kid in a flight or somewhere or in the airport or in a doctor's office or who knows where and will create doubts in his way. And with the help of the Satan, the Yetzer Hara, all of a sudden the boy will tell you, Abba, I want to try the other world. I don't want to be so fanatic, I don't want to be so religious. I can be religious, Shomer Shabbat. I'm going to change my yarmulke to Bennett yarmulke. I glue it with crazy glue on my bald head. Why not? What's wrong with that? It's also a keeper. I would wear jeans with holes, if you don't mind. The holes give me some air for my knees. Maybe the knees will sweat, you know. Oh, religious. Oh, I'm going to have rastot. You know, these people with the rastot and a little tiny yamaka, it's like the size of a quarter. Go find the treasure. <laughs> <laughs> it happened to me once in Queens Boulevard. He told me, I meet this guy. He's the son of a very big chazan, very famous chazan. I looked at him, could look like a goy to me. Hair like this. I said to the guy, my son is not religious. The Chazan is religious, famous religious Chazan. 
He's saying to me, why, why not? He's religious. So I don't see kippah. No. Torita Rosh. We found the lost object. Hiding, archaeological digging. To find his kippah. Why? Of course, embarrassed to show he's a Jew. Very nice to present himself like Bob Marley. Zchutoy again, Arav. You get the point or no? You have to teach your kids that when they come to a certain age, they have zero doubt and, will, and nobody can ever shake them up. No one. The opposite, they'll crush the other person. <laughs> right away, when he makes up his nonsense, right away they run away. Same thing like the Christian missionaries. When they come to all kinds of naive, ignorant Jews, they hunt them in a minute with some financial aid and the rest of their nonsense. Let them come to us that we know the nonsense of Christianity. In a minute, they run out of the door. Quickly! Why? Then they know they came to the wrong place. Knowledge is power. There's no bigger power than knowledge. Ignorance is a killer. It's the biggest enemy of the human being. Remember this. If you do not know the purpose of your life, you don't know the book of your creator, you don't know where you're going, you don't know what's right and what's wrong, you for sure will going to fail. And failure has major consequences. Very, very painful. Very, very painful. Nobody wants an open heart attack, nobody wants cancer. People do everything they can to avoid it, but if people would eat whatever they want and they expose themselves to dangerous things, that's what they're gonna get. That's why today they constantly talk about it. Be careful, be careful, this cause cancer, that cause, this can cause heart attack, cholesterol, this, that, saturated fat. The whole world is talking about it. Everyone into diet drinks, which by the way cause more cancer than other drinks. This is too much sugar, you have to put a warning on the bottle. What is all of that? We want our future to be better. When it comes to the most important thing, eternal future, almost nobody cares. We can live like monkeys. Eternal, eternal future. In a good place or in a horrible place, you sleep. It's dreaming. That's what I always tell you. The language that people understand the best is fear. Look what happened now after this attack. How many people talk different? How all of a sudden they hug Hasidim, they hug the Chabadnikim. Two months ago when they saw Chabadnik put filin, they used to curse him. I show you dozens of videos. Knock down the, the, the booth. Why are you making people put filin here? We don't allow. They gave them fine. 200 shekel fine. Not allowed to put fill in here. In the airport, some woman was screaming about the Chabadnik. Shame on you, in Hebrew. Why are you brainwash the kids? Why are you putting this fill in? I don't want to see this. Now all of a sudden, hugging them, hugging, dancing, give me tzitzit also. Tragedy. They, got, they learned the hard way. Remember what I always say. What's not coming from the head will come through the legs. In the head, it can come in a minute. You get the point and you stop doing what you do wrong. You don't want to learn the easy way. You learn with the open heart surgery. Six months in hospital with shots and cutting and chemo and who knows what. What doesn't come through the head will come in the end. The question is how? You want to learn in hell how to become pure? You learn it over there. No one will save you there. If you read in Rashid Chochma, what happened in the Shiva Medore Gehenom? Shiva Medore Gehenom. If you read what happened to the people and how they scream over there and there's zero mercy over there, there's no mercy in Gehenom. Zero, in this world, there's a lot of mercy. In Gehenom, the Torah says there's zero mercy. Do you know what it means to be in a place when there's no mercy from Hashem? And it's a lot worse than Auschwitz. Do you know what, what it means? You know, I had a bunch of teenagers in my house on Shabbat. My son and his friends. We wanted to do a minyan, but we were only 12 people. One of the Bachurei Shiva said, no, we better we go to the shul. I said, why, we have minyan? He said, because they don't answer amen, these American boys. 
I don't want to have uh, תפילה that only five, six answer amen. ברכות לבטלה. So we ask the American boys, can you guarantee to say amen on the ברכות? Guess what? They say no. We're not used to it. I said to them, I don't get it. They don't teach you in yeshiva how important it is to answer amen. I said to them, I don't remember one time in 30 years that I heard a bracha and didn't answer amen. It never happened to me once in 30 years. Once! And probably will never happen. I hear a bracha and not to answer amen? You know what a crime it is? Someone is praising Hashem and you don't, not with your head? You ignore it? Someone is praising the king and you ignore it like nothing is happening in front of you? You know what it means, amen? I confirm. I participate in the praise. That's what it means. It's mandatory. So my son, very good boy, tzaddik. He loves Hashem. You see how he daven. So it's really that serious? I say, yes. It's Mador Shlishi Bagenom. It's in the third section in Gehenom for not answering amen. So, wow, so bad. So you go bring Rashid Chochma. He brought the Rashid Chochma. It's Friday night. Hashem helped me. I open, boom, right on the page. Didn't have to turn pages. Say to him, read, Mador Shlishi. Shomea bracha mi chavero ve'eno ne'amen. Read, read what it is. Mador Shlishi bagenu. After that, everyone said, okay, okay. From now on, we're going to answer amen. This is kids that are ears in yeshiva. They are in yeshiva, they're tzaddikim, they, they love, they learn gemara, they, baruch Hashem. <laughs> you know, it's not chas v'shalom, the bad kids. And nobody ever taught them the importance of answering amen. They grew up with this, thinking it's no big deal, big deal, I don't answer amen. So what? It's not the end of the world. It is the end of the world. That's why there's such a horrible punishment for that. If it was a tiny thing, you would go to hell for that? Oh, Abba, again hell. <laughs> what do you mean again hell? What, you want to create a new religion? How many times hell is mentioned in the Gemara? Who knows? 133 times. I doubt that if there's anything who mentioned more times than this. Why the Chachamim wrote it 133 times with descriptions of what's happening there in the Talmud? Be politically correct. Hide it! Like they do in America, where they translate this legendary Kabbalistic book, Reshit Chochma, of the legendary holy Kabbalist, Rabbi Eliyahu Davidash, almost 500 years ago, in Tzfat, one of the important Musa books ever written. In English, they did not translate the sections of Genom. You don't have translation. They decide what part to translate and what part not to translate. Do you understand what, uh, what we're saying here? Someone decided to translate a holy book, 500 years, that everyone learned in so many thousands of places in Nishivot, and he decided this part we should translate to English. That American Jews should know it. This part is too strict, too scary. We're not going to translate it to English. First of all, in my opinion, it's a huge crime to do such thing to pick and choose from a holy book. I think this is good and you don't want to teach the book because there are parts there that you don't think that you want to teach the people. Okay, don't touch it. You cannot decide what parts of the book is kosher to learn and what part we shouldn't learn. It's not, who are you to decide to modify the book? You publish a book in a different language, you cannot change one word. It has to be translated 100%. You take out one word is a crime. I saw one person show me a book that they explained the Mishnah Brura and some of the things that the Chafetzaim wrote, they did not put. They didn't put. Why? It was against their agenda. Say to me, look how they modified the Chafetzaim. Mishnah Brura. Some of the words, look, in the original, look in the English one, look different. That's a crime. You come and take the words of the Holy Chafetz Chaim from 100 years ago and you modify it because it doesn't suit your p political agenda. <laughs> what a crime it is. And then, you know, these people, by the way, they laugh at the reform people. <laughs> reform. Reform rabbi. 
There's a lot to laugh. But who said that you're any better? They probably never learned one day in their life in a normal yeshiva, these reform clowns. What do they know from their life? We have zero expectation from them. But you went 20, 30 years to yeshiva, and now you come to translate the book to English, and you modify the book? Who is a bigger criminal, the reform clown or you? I leave it to your decision. You translate, translate it exactly as it was. You don't want to translate, don't translate. All right, I translate one chapter from this book, that's it. But you cannot sell the book like this, with a cover, and people will read it not knowing, Americans won't know, that there are, a whole chapter is missing here. You understand what I'm saying here, no? If you say, to begin with, I translate one chapter, okay. No, everyone knows, it's not a whole book. But you sell in a book stores that parts of the, what's the Holy Kabbalist all 500 years ago are missing from the book? Why is it? Because you don't want to reflect fear on the people. And that's why the generation looks like that. Because no one has fear from anything anymore. God loves me. <laughs> God loves me. Whatever I do, he loves me. That's not what the Torah says. Some people he loves, some people he hates. Where does it say clearly that Hashem hates people in the Torah? In the Tanakh, where does it say? Et Yaakov Avdi ve'et Esav Saneti. I love Jacob and I hate Esav. <laughs> clearly. How can you hate Esav? He's the son of Yitzchak and Avraham. He's a grandson of Avraham Avinu. He's a son of Yitzchak Avinu. He's a brother of Yaakov Avinu. You know where the royal family came from? His father is a big rebbe. His grandfather is the founder of the Hasidut. Avraham Avinu. But he's a Rasha Merusha. I can't stand him. One day, Yosef, the son of Yaakov, will turn into fire and Esav will turn into straw, and the fire will burn the straw. Actually, Yosef will turn into a flame. Flame, fire, flame. What's the difference, fire or flame? You got the point. Yaakov will be a fire. Flame, Do you get the point, Rabotai? Ah, you say three times, Ashre Yosef Betecha every day, and you lie. Why you lie? You're allowed to, to, to lie in the middle of the prayers? What, your ideology, Hashem loves everyone. <laughs> but you say every day three times, Shomer Hashem et kol o'avav, ve'et kol ha'reshaim, Yashmid, will destroy, you know what Yashmid means? For eternity. It didn't say it will kill the reshaim. Kill the reshaim, they may have olam haba, okay. Yashmid, Yashmid means shmad, the neshama is destroyed for eternity. Yashmid, there's no worse word than that. That's the end of the wicked people in the Torah. If you don't believe in it, don't pray. Because you're a liar. You, you pray with lies. You pray and you say Hashem will destroy the wicked and five minutes later you say, oh, Hashem loves the wicked. If you only knew how much you love the wicked Jew, yeah, you're a liar. Make up your mind. You believe what you read or no? If you believe, you're allowed to pray. If not, you're a liar. You, you lie to Hashem in the middle of praying. You know, in the Tefillat Shmona I don't understand how these modern liberals with a little tiny yamaka, how they pray Tefillat Shmona How? How they have the nerve to pray Tefillat Shmona In the middle of Tefillat Shmona it's written, we have a bracha. Laminim velamalshinim al tihi tikva. וכל הזדים כרגע יאבדו, וכל אויביך וכל שונאיך מהרה יכרתו, ומלכות הרשעה מהרה תעקר ותשבר ותחלם במהרה בימינו. ברוך אתה השם שעובר אויבים ומכניע זדים. What is he talking about this bracha? That Hashem will destroy all the wicked, all the snitch, all the traders, all the lefty liberals, all the people who help our enemies to destroy us. All the people that fight the yeshivot and all the people that sue in a secular court. Mosrim, Minim, Apikorsim. 
those who have no shirt in the world to come. You pray three times a day with a tiny yarmulke and you're a criminal lawyer. You're suing people in the criminal laws, Jews, religious Jews. You take away their homes. You take away everything. You send them to jail and according to the Torah, they're righteous. How do you pray Tfilat Shmona Esre? And they let him be Chazan. We're talking about you, you fool. You cursing yourself. Yes. צריך להגיד להם, good luck with that. טוב, I'm tired, let's go. ברוך אדוני לעולם, אמן ואמן. רבי חנניה בן הקשיא אומר, הצעה הקדוש ברוך הוא לזכות את ישראל, לפיכך הרבה להם תורה ומצוות, שנאמר, אדוני חפץ למען צדקו, יגדיל תורה ויאדיר.